Hello, my name is Tony. Biggles, then. What's that all about? James Bigglesworth, nicknamed Biggles, is a fictional English World War I fighter pilot flying ace type created by Captain William Earl Johns, who was a real-life World War I fighter pilot flying ace type. Wonder where his inspiration for the character came from? Biggles first appeared in the popular flying magazine story The White Fokker. That's Fokker as in German fighter plane, not some white guy who's a bit of a dick. The first book publication of short stories The Camels Are Coming was published in 1932. Johns continued to write Biggles novels and stories until 1968. Then he stopped on account of being dead. There are over a hundred volumes out there and I've read a grand total of, uh, none. So I'm not going to comment on the literary quality or lack of because I'm in no position to do so. Apparently, Biggles was a typical English fictional war hero, a gentlemanly warrior, a brave man of action, designed to appeal to adolescent males in the type of boys' own adventures adolescent males would predominantly be attracted to. Sort of Enid Blyton for teenage warmongers. When I was a violent teenager, X-rated movies and pulp novels from the New English Library were my staples, so Biggles didn't really manage a blip on my depraved radar. In and of their time, however, the novels were continuously successful with whoever their audience was. Surprisingly, or perhaps not, depending on how you look at it, adaptations into other forms of entertainment media have been scarce. There was a British TV series in 1960 made by Granada. It's spanned 44 30-minute black-and-white episodes and starred Neville Whitting as Biggles and pop singer John Layton as his sidekick Ginger. Whitting faded into obscurity very quickly and Layton appeared in supporting roles in war films The Great Escape, Guns at Batasi and Von Ryan's Express. There's a DVD of the complete series available from Publishers Network, which I found online retailing for £60 sterling. Although I'm oddly intrigued, I'm not oddly intrigued 60 quid's worth, so bugger that. Then in 1986, we got this, Biggles Adventures in Time. Now, I never saw it in the cinema, only on VHS. I remember watching it in my then living room on a machine the size of the battleship Potemkin, through a haze of cigarette smoke whilst desperately numbing my senses with cans of Tenants Extra. I also remember not being overly impressed. So why this review? Well, when I started uploading to this channel, I resolved not to just focus on stuff I really liked that had specific meaning to me, but to look occasionally at movies and shows that were held in a certain regard by others. As luck would have it, for the most part, there has been a pleasing overlap, a synchronicity, some compatibility of taste and preference, and it's been okay, but occasionally this has not been the case. So, when Bodhi of CI5 brought up this particular offering, I thought, why not? Well, I didn't actually. I thought, I'm not doing that. Then I thought, after he brought it up again, well, where's the harm? So is this going to be one of those fruitless and tortuous endeavours of torment, or has the passage of time afforded me a more kindly and tolerant perspective towards Biggles the movie? We shall see, pilgrims. Since 1968, when the rights were sold wholesale, there was talk of a Biggles film. Various actors were attached to the project over the years, including James Fox, Dudley Moore, Oliver Reed and Jeremy Irons. It wasn't until the mid-80s that we got one. Biggles film, that is. Originally, the producers were aiming at Raiders of the Lost Ark profile, but the success of Back to the Future prompted a shift in creative direction and time travel became the hook. John Howe was a mid-level film and TV director, a moderate talent with no real signature style. He'd previously made three movies I personally enjoyed. There was Eyewitness, a B-movie thriller from 1970, the Hammer novelty vampire opus Twins of Evil in 71, the novelty being the casting of two well-endowed female glamour models who were twins, and the underrated version of the Richard Matheson horror novel The Legend of Hell House in 73. I suppose I could add the Peter Fonda car chase exploitation venture Dirty Mary Crazy Larry from 74, but for reasons I won't go into here, I always found it a source of irritation. Howe also worked for Disney for a spell on Escape to Witch Mountain, Return from Witch Mountain, and The Watcher in the Woods. Not an especially inspired choice of director, but neither was he a categorically bad one either. Cast-wise, the leading players had me thinking mostly, who the fuck are you? Biggles was played by Neil Dixon. Who the fuck are you? Biggles' time twin, Jim Ferguson, I'll explain in due course, was played by Alex Hyde-White. Who the fuck are you? Jim's girlfriend, Debbie, was played by Fiona Hutchison. Who the fuck are you? Air Commodore Colonel William Raymond is played by Peter Cushing. Now I know who the fuck you are. 
Don't misunderstand me, I don't mind that the cast is made up of largely unknowns, because isn't that how successful screen actors start out? But it helps if the unknowns have some personality, screen presence and acting talent. Does this hold true here? Let me answer that with another question. Where are they now? This was Peter Cushing's last movie role. I believe he was cast to raise the profile of the thing and to capitalise on his being recognisable to younger audiences who associated him with Star Wars. Cushing, like Christopher Lee, had that rare quality of being able to rise above the material they were given to work with, and in so doing make said material appear better than it was, a bonus for any movie constrained by budget, talent and positive eminence. Musically, the soundtrack turned out to be an interesting one. Composed by Stanislaw Sajewick, it employed experimental themes and synthesizers, and the addition of some rock songs supplied by John Anderson of Yes and John and Vangelis, Deep Purple, Motley Crue, and Queen. John Deacon of Queen co-wrote the track No Turning Back, which was credited to John Deacon and the Immortals. It was released as a single, the video for which featured Peter Cushing. The single flopped like the penis of a 98-year-old in a state of advanced Narcosis. Cinematography was by Ernie Vince, who later captured the visuals for the Madonna Sean Penn Super Turkey Shanghai Surprise. Script came courtesy of two no name TV hacks, John Groves and Kent Walwyn. Who the fuck are they? If you're wondering what we got as a finished product, here's the story, Morning Glory. After an encounter with sinister Air Commodore Colonel William Raymond Peter Cushing, New York advertising executive Jim Ferguson Alex Hyde-White is struck by lightning bolts and transported back in time to the trenches of World War I. It's 1917 and he encounters flying ace James Biggles Bigglesworth Neil Dixon. Turns out they are time twins, linked together by some freaky deaky sci-fi thing or other that isn't explained. Might be that's just as well. Any attempted relevant and coherent reasoning is not going to be the this film's strong point. Along with Biggles' trio of comrades, Algy, Bertie and Ginger, they work together to destroy a German super weapon, the inventively named Sound Weapon, which can burn and fossilise human flesh and inorganic matter such as cannons and things. This is complicated by both Ferguson and Biggles and even Debbie flipping between their respective time zones, so the action is split between the present and the past. The villain of the piece, von Stahlhein, Marcus Gilbert, yep, who the fuck is he, is out to stop them and use the super weapon to win the war and thus change the course of history. Biggles and Ferguson wind up with a Bell Model 206 B-11 Jet Ranger helicopter that's been transported to the past. This helps even the odds. How does Biggles know how to fly it? Well, he reasons if you can fly a sop with camel, you can fly anything. I sincerely doubt that, but the reasoning just about sums up the philosophy of the film. Neil Dixon, whoever he may have been, makes, in my limited scope of judgement, a reasonable Biggles, not far removed from what I imagine the character to be, or at least in keeping with what I know about him. Hyde White and Fiona Hutchison look as if they've been transplanted in from an 80s daytime soap opera, something not quite Dallas or Dynasty, more dumbass or dysentery. Hutchison is model pretty, with her swept back hair and sculpted makeup. She pales a bit in comparison to the gorgeous Francesca Gonshaw as Biggles' romantic interest Marie. Yep, yeah, I know who the fuck is she, but nonetheless she's a real stunner to look at. Sexist pig that I am. Hyde White acts with all the expression and conviction of a plasterboarded drywall. If he looked that blank in a hospital for long enough they'd switch off the life support. He's a rock solid non-personality cardboard cutout. Cushing presents as frail and alien, but still manages to provide something of an emotional core to the film, injecting some genuine poignancy into the scene where he encounters Biggles once again. Bit of acting thrown in there. Second unit director Terry Coles, who had worked on the Battle of Britain, delivers some competent aerial sequences. The London location shots and action set around Tower Bridge are a welcome scenic diversion, as are the surprisingly grim depictions of trench warfare. The scene where Algy, Bertie and Ginger take on a squad of Germans in the church courtyard is a decent and fun little shootout. Beckton Gasworks makes for a desolate and eerie location for some of the set pieces. Stanley Kubrick would use the venue for his climactic battle scenes in Full Metal Jacket a year later. There is some humour that works well. The scene where Ferguson is firing a machine gun at the enemy and is snapped spontaneously back to the present to find himself firing on a London police car is a notable example, as is the encounter with a gang of punks and rasters complete with a boombox blasting out metal music. 
A lot of the humour bombs like lead because the actors, I use the term loosely, have no idea how to handle comedy. When Ferguson is whipped back to his hotel room from 1917 wearing a nun's habit and Debbie and her dumb fat colleague encounter him there, it should have been a funny moment. It just dies on his arse. The final sequence with Ferguson catapulted from his wedding into the past to a cave in New Guinea where the cannibal natives are Biggles, Algae, Bertie and Ginger tied up in a big cooking pot completely flatlines its way to the close of the film. What could have been satirical and Python-esque is just stony-faced and moribund, ill-conceived and misdirected. Okay, bottom line is it's infantile, cheesy, poorly scripted, sub-comic book tripe, but not in a malicious or malevolent way. It won't induce a hair-pulling apoplexy or drive you to a life-altering stroke. It's too lightweight and well-intentioned for that. I'm not going to recommend watching it to anyone because it's too much responsibility to willfully risk people wasting their valuable time. What I will say, though, is if you fancy a whimsical taste of the 80s, if you're a hopeless Biggles fan and you feel you can't live without experiencing some big-screen manifestation of the character, if you truly love unsophisticated, mindless junk fests, it might spark your target. Me, I must admit to smiling broadly at the line, let's show this sausage guzzler what this thing can do, and for harbouring a great respect for Mr. Cushing. Rewatching it on the Blu-ray format for the sake of this review, I will admit to enjoying it more than when I first fired it up on VHS. Not much more, but enough to be a little more forgiving and appreciate that the film does at least try to be entertaining in a wholly unpretentious way. Innocently crap, in other words. And sometimes that's not so bad. Days later, I'm still thinking about it with something appropriate in nostalgic affection. And if Hollywood churns out much more disturbingly atrocious and hyper-arrogant woke doggerel like the 355, Biggle's Adventures in Time could well find itself reconsidered a work of majestic towering creative genius in comparison. Now there's something to think about. A flop of a frivolous fantasy bauble from 1986, a preferable option to a multi-million dollar high concept thriller from today. Adventures in Time indeed. Thanks as always for your time and attention. It's nice if you can spare the time to like, not like, or leave a comment or subscribe. If you can't, no worries. I'll be working my way back to you. Threat of the moment. Meanwhile, here's a song called Gimme Shell Shock. Here we come, wait till the whistle blows Johnny on the spot, over the top Young dudes all in a row In no man's land you fight to stay alive Don't lose your head and you just might survive You've got a thought block, you're in a deadlock Give me hard knocks, give me shell shock You've got a thought block, you're in a deadlock Give me hard knocks, give me shell shock What do you know, here we go Barreling into the fray Johnny on the money, it really isn't funny Ordnance can ruin your day Out in the field, no time to ruminate Stick to your guns and never hesitate You've got a thought block, you're in a deadlock Give me hard knocks Give me shell shock, you got a thought block, you're in a deadlock, give me hard knocks, give me shell shock. Keep on keeping on, no time to wait, you're better off in tempting fate, than your head on a stick at trader's gate. No, don't leave it too late. You 
you got a thought block You're in a deadlock Give me hard knocks Give me shell shock You got a thought block You're in a deadlock Give me hard knocks Give me shell shock You're not at Woodstock Forget your body clock Give me hot rocks Give me shell shock